Hallelujah. Oh, well, this is, I've been pondering this message for a couple of weeks. You know, last year, last week, if I'd taught something, I probably would have taught something different, but, um, yeah, I just didn't feel like that's the direction I needed to go. So this week, we're going to talk about something that we don't talk about very often in this church, and there's a reason for that. You know? um, this week, I want to talk about giving, you know, um, or specifically the tithe. Now, for a lot of us who have come out of word of faith movements, um, that word tithe comes with some heavy connotations. In fact, when I was talking to Randy about this, Randy said, I don't know if you should even use that word, you know. And I think that the Greece movement has vilified that word. Um, we've made it something we don't talk about um, because so many of us were burned with the message about money. See, Randy and I come out of a situation where we were taught that in order to qualify for financial blessings, you had to tithe. You know, the tithe is what opened the windows of heaven so that God could pour out a blessing into your life. The tithe is what qualified you to receive God's blessings. And I say it now and I go, how could I have believed that? You know, but that was before I got a revelation of grace. And the way grace came to Randy and I just came subtly through little ideas. You know, we were hearing this message every Sunday. Every Sunday there was a message about money. And every Sunday, it was the tithe was glorified. In fact, I have heard pastors say, when someone comes in for counseling, are you a tither? You know, as though if you're not a tither, then no wonder you're having problems. Oh, see, it's just wickedness. Huh? Huh? Oh, man. Man, we learn, and see, Terry knows, we learn some garbage. We learn some really gucky stuff. And the temptation, now that we came to grace, you know, and it came to me just subtly, just little idea, I, I thought to myself, you know, Scripture says that my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory, why do I, ha by, by Christ Jesus, why do, why, what am I doing giving this money again? See, and I literally have known people who have borrowed money to sow into the church because they were expecting a hundredfold return. It's got complete distortion of the word of God. That is not what God taught. So, Along with this revelation that we had been taught lies, came a lot of anger. Okay, for me, anyway, I was angry for a long time. And it has taken a while for me to come to the place where I can, I can stop being angry. You know, the people that taught me these wrong teachings, they did it out of an attitude of, they wanted the best for me. They really believed this was truth, and they thought they were helping me. They didn't realize that what they were doing was heaping condemnation on me. Or the, the other thing is, when you are a tither, you know, the message of being blessed because you tithe does one of two things. It either makes you feel condemned because obviously you're not doing right because it's not working. So you feel condemnation. So then you, you're on this hamster wheel to give more. And then you find yourself getting broker. <coughs> Excuse me. That's one thing it produces. And the other thing is over here, when you're a tither and things are wonderful in your life and you have plenty of money, then you're very smug and very proud. 
because ultimately what the message of teaching that you have to tithe in order to be blessed does, it puts it all in your lap. And it ignores everything that Jesus Christ did. And we get all this stuff from Malachi. Malachi chapter 3. And that is an Old Testament scripture. Um, and I have heard ministers try and convince us that that is not the law. But they are wrong. It is the law. And in order to understand what's happening in Malachi 3, uh, I suppose we should read this. Ugh. Anyway, so <clears throat> Malachi chapter 3, I think we start in verse 8. There we go. So, this is the New International Version, NIV. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you in tithes and offerings? You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in, your, in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Now, this verse, these verses have been used to manipulate people for centuries. I mean, what better way for a church to get money than to say, man, if you don't bring the tithes and the offerings, God's going to curse you. <coughs> Excuse me. But is that the God you and I know? Is that the Father we know? I don't think so. We have to understand what Malachi was doing because what's Malachi doing in this Old Testament scripture? There are two things that are happening here. First of all, Malachi is pointing out lawbreakers under the Old Covenant. And secondly, Malachi is a prophet and he is pointing forward to the law keeper who is Jesus Christ. And it would be a grave mistake for you and I to look at Malachi and read it as though we are involved in the situation where Malachi was pointing out lawbreakers. Because we are now on the other side of the cross. We are living in the prophecy. And Malachi was pointing to the law keeper who is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So when we read this, these verses with the law mindset, there is condemnation. There is judgment. There is anger. But if we will refocus and look at these verses and what they're pointing to, we can find great peace in these verses. And that's what I want to do. And you know, I, I so love Connie Witter because she points out something um, that's really important for us to remember. And it's in John 4:18 in the Passion Version. It says, you know, first of all, it says, God is love. And in 1 John 4:18, the Passion Version, it says, love never brings fear, for fear is always related to punishment. But love's perfection drives out the fear of, drives the fear of punishment far from our hearts. Whoever walks constantly afraid of punishment has not reached love's perfection. So when we hear a message that causes us to feel fear and condemnation, use this as a guideline. God is love. He is never going to use fear to teach you. Because as love, he is perfect love, 
Perfect love drives out all fear because fear always deals with punishment. And God is not punishing his children because Jesus Christ took our punishment on the cross. And now God has placed into our hearts the comforter, not the corrector, the comforter. Now, does the Holy Spirit correct us? Yes, he does. But he always does it in a way that leads to peace, that lets us know we are loved. It never brings condemnation and fear because the Holy Spirit always corrects us with love. So, in a message about tithing and giving, if you are hearing something that makes you feel condemnation or fear, either you're hearing wrong or the message is just flat out a lie. <clears throat> but it's a good judge, a good rule of thumb. As you hear messages, weigh that. Is this causing me to have fear in my heart? Then what's wrong? Because a message from God will not cause fear. And so this message about giving shouldn't cause fear, shouldn't cause condemnation, because there is none in Christ Jesus. So now back to Malachi. So what do we see here? In verse 9 it says, You are under a curse. See, in the Old Covenant, when you did not tithe, you were under the curse. That is bad news. In fact, it says the whole nation of Israel was under a curse because they were part of the covenant. And when they broke their part of it, then they brought the curse into their life. But what does the New Testament tell us? In the New Testament, I have to find this. Ah, in the New Testament, looking at Galatians 3, Let me see, in verse 13. Yet Christ paid the full price to set us free from the curse of the law. He absorbed it completely as he became a curse in our place. For it is written, everyone who is hung upon a tree is doubly cursed. Jesus, our Messiah, was cursed in our place and in so doing dissolved the curse from our lives so that all the blessings of Abraham can be poured out upon even non-Jewish believers. And now God gives us the wonderful promise of the Holy Spirit who lives within us when we believe in him. See, under the old covenant, when you didn't tithe, you received the curse. Under the new covenant, Jesus took the curse away. You can't be cursed. There's no way for you to be cursed. So whether you give or whether you don't give, you are free from the curse of the law. Hallelujah. That's good news. That's good news. So when you read this, no, this is not written to you. You are not cursed with a curse. Jesus Christ freed you from the curse. Hallelujah. So bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. See, under the old covenant, no tithe meant no food in your house. Aha. That was the old covenant. See, if you didn't give your tithe, then, then you didn't eat. You know, there was a curse on your finances. <clears throat> under the new covenant, what does it say? I got to find this now. So... Ah, under the new, now under the new, in John 6, 55 and 56, under the new covenant, Jesus is the meat that sustains his people. See, under the old covenant, it was the tithe that brought meat into your storehouse. Under the new covenant, it's Jesus. John 6, 55 says, For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. So, under the new covenant, Jesus 
is the one. You know, you have to think about how did Jesus read these verses when it says, bring the tithe into the storehouse so that there would be meat, there would be food in the storehouse. Jesus read that and he knew that he was the sacrifice that had to be given. And through his sacrifice, what is the meat and the drink that we have? It's his own body and blood. It's his own body and blood. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Jesus is the tithe for us. Jesus is the one. The, under the old covenant, it said that if you gave the tithe, the Lord says, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. See? Under the old covenant, the tithe is what opened up the floodgates so that God could bring blessing into your life. Under the new covenant, Jesus Christ has opened up the windows of heaven for us through his body and his blood. The windows of heaven are no longer closed to anyone. The veil in the temple was torn in two. The holy of holy is open to you and I, and we can come freely into the throne of grace and receive mercy when we need it. And it's not because of your tithe. It's because of Jesus Christ. Your tithe does not open up the windows of heaven to you. Jesus Christ opened up the windows of heaven to you. And you have a Father who loves you, and if you have a need, you can go right to him. And he will never turn his back on you. He will never shut the door in your face. He's never going to close the windows of heaven to you. Hallelujah. And it's because of Jesus. Oh, this is a verse I can get excited about now. I can get excited about Malachi now. I can read this and I can live it and I cannot be in fear because the curse doesn't belong to me. The curse doesn't belong to you. The windows of heaven have been opened because of Jesus Christ. And Malachi was pointing forward to this time and this place. Man, you know, when you go forward in, into Malachi, going forward, God's talking. In verse 17, he says, On that day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possessions. I will spare them just as a father has compassion and spares his sons who serve him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who not. See, this is, this is prophecy. This is prophesying ahead to a time when there would be a law keeper who would open the windows of heaven for us. Hallelujah. Isn't that good? That's so good. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, under the old covenant, God required the tenth, the tithe. That's where we get that word tithe. It means tenth. And that was required under the law. See? Now, and I, you know, you hear Christians doing religious things. You know, because they separate the law up, see. They separate it up, see. They say, well, you know, there's the ceremonial law. That we don't have to do anymore. And then there's, you know, the Ten Commandments, though. Those are laws we still have to do. And then there's, you know, and I'm going, you know what? No. Scripture is really clear. If you think that you are obligated to keep one law, you are obligated to keep them all. Scripture is clear on that. <clears throat> I, I want to find it, so. Praise God. Ah, I'm not going to find it. 
But I mean, it's, I think it's in Galatians or Romans. Uh, I obviously didn't copy it. Oh, no, it's in Galatians, Galatians 3. So for the scripture, 3.11, for the scriptures reveal, and it's obvious, that no one achieves the righteousness of God by attempting to keep the law, for it is written, those who have been made holy will live by faith. But keeping the law does not require faith, but self-effort. And I want to say something to you. This is probably the worst part about that message about tithing. Tithing requires no faith. It's all about self-effort. It's all about self-effort. It's all about, oh, I'm so good. I'm giving so much. No, that's just, that's just evil even to think it. <clears throat> that you can give to God. Oh, bro, come on. You can't add anything to God. Oh, man. So, but anyway, so those who, by keeping the law, keeping the law does not require faith but self-effort, for the law teaches, if you practice the principles of law, you must follow all of them. Yet Christ paid the full price to set us free from the curse of the law. And there we go into where he became the curse for us. See, if tithing is something required in the New Testament church, then all of it would be required. And this is the argument that they had with the Jewish church and the Gentile church back at the beginning of, you know, back at the beginning of Christianity. We read about it in Galatians. Now in Galatians, the Judaizers were trying to bring in little pieces of the law, saying that you had to keep them, you know. And so it's the same thing with tithe. You see the churches today bringing in little pieces of the law and saying that you have to keep them, but that doesn't make it so. And by doing that, what we're doing is saying, yeah, Jesus died for you, and it is finished, rah, rah, and you are righteous and holy and perfect, except you have to do these things that Christian doo-doo. That's what I call it, Christian doo-doo. <clears throat> if you are being told that there is anything that you have to do in order to qualify yourself for the blessings of God, you've been told, you're listening to a lie. The only thing that qualifies you to receive the blessings of God in your life is Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. You are qualified. You are in him. Anything that is rightfully the inheritance of Jesus is rightfully your inheritance too. You are co-heirs with Christ. Amazing. Amazing. And there's no qualifier on that. It's because you are in him. And that's just amazing how much God loves us. See, you know, at any time in history, God could have just forgiven sins. He could have just forgiven sins. That would not have made you righteous. See, the whole point of Jesus Christ dying and taking the sin away was so that he could impart to you his righteousness so that you could be one with him in spirit. God's plan was so much bigger than we've ever taught or believed. Hallelujah. And it requires nothing on your part except to believe. That we can do. <clears throat> and that's all that's required, is putting our faith and trust in Jesus. So what was I getting on? So... And it'll be a short one because that's the way it goes sometimes. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, I want to go back to this Galatians. See, what was happening in Galatians is they were arguing about circumcision. You know, they were saying that in order to become a Christian, you had to follow the Ten Commandments and you had to be circumcised. 
in order to become a Christian. And, and Paul comes strongly against that in Galatians. And uh, in Galatians 5, 6, he said this powerful thing. He said, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So when it comes to the matter of tithing, you know, I've, I've heard lots of people who come to me and they say, should I tithe? Well, as soon as you throw the word should on it, you just made yourself a law. And there really are only two answers to that question, should I tithe? You can say you should tithe, you should not tithe. That's the only two answers you can give. Let's bring this modern day, let's bring this, huh? How about, how about should I give? <clears throat> That's a better question. Well, of course you should give. But I mean, I, even if you should, take the should off, you know, because you're making a law towards yourself. So should I, should I tithe? Well, I should tithe. I should not tithe. Back in Paul's day, the question was, should I be circumcised? You know, I should be circumcised. I should not be circumcised. Let's look at this verse here. It's for in Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. Let's put it into this modern day. What we're talking about, should I tithe? For in Christ Jesus, neither tithing nor not tithing has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You know, it's none of my business what you decide to give. And I encourage you to be givers because, first of all, you have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in you. God is the ultimate giver. Under the Old Covenant, God required 10% from the people. Under the New Covenant, he required everything that he had, and he gave everything he had in Jesus Christ. He paid the full tithe in Jesus Christ, doubly. So, but here in the New Testament... Neither tithing nor not tithing has any value. What has value? It's the motivation of the heart. Whatever you do with your giving, let it be an expression of your faith and your love. When you give, let it be an expression of faith. If you're giving and you're feeling any fear about what you're giving, don't do it. Don't give. You know, but we should be able to give joyfully because we know that God's always got our back and he will always supply our needs according to his riches and glory. And so if I have to give, see, what I came out of, we were taught that you had to give in order to get. Under grace, we get to give. We get to give. It's a blessing. We give because we have been blessed. We don't give in order to be blessed. You can't give what you haven't received. See, but under grace, we give because we have received. And we're joyful and we're thankful. And that, out of the love in our heart, we give expression to that by our giving. And people, see, under grace, there are no rules. There are no rules to your giving. Give as middle, little or as much as you like. Give wherever you like, however you like. Giving isn't limited to money. In fact, the tithe never was money. It was always whatever you produced in your field. You know. So forget about the tithe. What do you determine in your own heart? 
How can you express this love of God that you have received? Now, maybe that's money. You know, maybe, maybe it's time. Maybe it's, oh, I don't know, whatever it is. Whatever you determine in your own heart to give between you and God. But tithing, not tithing, has no value. What does have value? The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through law. So, like I said, it's going to be short today. But somehow I felt like this was a message that we needed to hear. You know, and you guys probably already know this stuff. But man, for a long time, tithing was just a dirty word in my mind. And it's and, and now it's, that word has lost all its bad connotations because now it's just a matter of giving. Giving out of a heart, expressing love. And I can do that, I can give to my neighbor, I can give to the church, I can give to whatever ministry or anywhere. You know, if I want to give to an orphanage somewhere, See, I'm not limited. I'm not limited. Hallelujah. And neither are you under grace. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us Jesus Christ, your tithe, and that that tithe, that was paid in full, Father, and you opened the windows of heaven for us. And we thank you, Father, because we have Jesus. We have your blessings. And Father, we thank you that out of a grateful heart, out of a joyous heart, out of a thankful heart, we can express our faith and our love through the things that we give. Help us, Father, to know where to give. Guide our hands so that we can give into ministries and give into lives so that those people can be blessed and brought to you. And we give you praise and glory for the meal that's been prepared for us today. And we thank you, Father, for the people that prepared it. And Father, we just ask that you would once again um, bless this fellowship that we have. In Jesus' name, amen.